the words of Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now I have a dream that we will implement love, not hate, or supporting another Jim Crow's agenda. CRT is not an honest dialogue. It is a tactic that was used by Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan on slavery very many years ago to dumb down my ancestors so we could not think for ourselves. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. Let me educate you. An honest dialogue does not impress, oppress. An honest dialogue does not implement hatred or injustice. It's to communicate with deceiving, without deceiving people. Today, we don't need your agreement. We want action in the backbone for what we asked for today, to ban CRT. We don't want your political advertisement to divide our children or belittle them. Think twice before you indoctrinate such racist theories. You cannot tell me what is or is not racist. Look at me. I had to come down here today to tell you to your face that we are coming together and we are strong. This will not be the last. Greet and meet respectfully. Wow. Something remarkable is happening around the country wherein far-left academics and media elites are trying to quietly push an ideology, a new American religion known as critical race theory, into public schools, popular cultural, uh, national museums, hospitals, sports teams, and cable news, you name it. And every day, people are pushing back, saying no to the idea of organizing all of our history and our interactions and our lives by race saying no to categorizing ourselves in oppressor and oppressed classes, and by extension, assigning virtue and the right to speak and the command of fact based on your status, which is granted not even by skin color in some cases, but just by contrition, bowing down to these rules. The critical race theorists, a slice of black intellectuals backed up by even more white academics and ethno-Marxists, if we're being honest, are moving fast to remodel society in their vision of racial conflict. There was even an incident that broke out over the weekend. Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer, part of the Space Force Division of the Air Force, was dropped from his post following a self-publication of his book, Irresistible Revolution, Marxism's Goal of Conquest and the Unmaking of the American Military, which asserts that CRT, critical race theory, is being advanced in the ranks of the armed forces. We're gonna talk about why this is happening and how to beat it. Because the Republican Party of Donald Trump, to their credit, they answered this fight by trying to use the force of government to ban these ideas from classrooms and apply federal pressure to school districts and the bureaucracy to not teach critical race theory. And while I want to see critical race theory taken apart and kicked to the curb of public discourse, I'm not too keen on the methods that we seem to have available. We're gonna unpack this today. I'm Stephen Kent, and you're watching Right Now on Rightly. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button on YouTube or on your podcatcher, and leave a comment or review, and you can follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook at Rightly AJ. My guests are Christian Watson, he's the host of the Pensive Politics podcast and YouTube channel, as well as the spokesperson for Color Us United, and Adam Coleman. He's the founder of Wrong Speak Publishing and author of Black Victim to Black Victor. Guys, welcome to you both. It's really nice to have you here today. Christian, part of what is so hard to discuss about this subject in terms of the great debate, the discourse over race, is that it has evolved so rapidly at a pace uh, which you know I myself and I think a lot of the public feel that they cannot even keep up with what is being discussed and under what terms we're having the discussion about race. Um, you know, I guess I just want to get from you, what is CRT, what's your operating definition, and how does it differ from some of the more benign, harmless ideas that have been pushed in colleges and corporate America about like diversity trainings, inclusion and sensitivity for so long? Because those were never really packaged as threatening ideologies, but CRT seems to be something different. Well, and I'm positive that the proponents of CRT would not package their ideology as threatening at all. I'm sure they would actually say that it is essential for the survival of African Americans in this sort of racially infused age that we have. But to answer your first question, CRT is nothing more than a rhetorical tool uh, meant to strategize how to, in the words of the scholars, beat systemic racism in every aspect of society. So it starts with a few presuppositions. It believes that systemic racism is ingrained into 
to the fabric of American society and that all of our institutions exercise it and that the best way and pretty much the only way to fight it is to have a quote unquote critical method that critiques all the institutions. Um, the problem is that this assumes that everything in anything has a racial bias or a racial animus to it. And without really proving that, that's not really a good operating um, definition to go under. And not only that, it also assumes that diversity and inclusion, social justice, and a bunch of other terms which may seem benign, but are actually a part of the same genre and subgenre of critical race theory are going to be essential into breaking down the power hierarchies and the differentiations um, that supposedly cause injustice. Mm -hmm. So really, it's just one giant package deal um, that they are giving uh, to black Americans. But in all honesty, I think that it is quite nefarious given that it doesn't actually have any nuance or complexity. It's all just one answer. And the great theory Hannah Arendt said, when you have a fictitious world, you can have tyranny easily, easily, more easily set in. So that's my, that's my I overall I want to get Adam in here, and if that definition sort of checks out, that's how you think of it as well? Yeah, I, I think he is more, um, he's probably more in keen as far as the deeper um, meaning of what CRT is. But I like to focus more on what does it produce? What is the outcome of CRT? Um, and what is... What is actually driving CRT? I personally think that CRT can only exist in a society that is of good nature. Um, imagine if everyone is actually racist, why would they want to repent against it? It's the, it's the norm. But people who are of good nature want to change to have a better society. So why would you employ mm. something that is proposing that this is to help people? Um, so actually, CRT, it basically, um, takes advantage of people's good nature, uh, which is the purpose of it, is to take advantage of people's good nature. Meanwhile, there are always people who are profiting off of it, whether it be economically or from power or um, whichever way you want to look at it. But someone is gaining while others are losing. Um, so if you want to help people, you must sacrifice. If you want to help people, you must listen to what we say. And if you don't go with what we say, then you will be, uh, you will be punished. Uh, we will label you with a scarlet red letter of being a racist, and that only hurts someone who is not racist. Uh, I'm, right. sh I'm sure someone who is racist would be like, thank you for recognizing what I am. Uh, but yeah, Christian, what were you going to say? Uh, if, I, if I may, um, the, the, the comment about good nature is quite interesting. But I'm not entirely sure it, it, it really explains the core root of why some people may go along with critical race theory. You know, there's this ancient debate in political theory about how do you make sure people are virtuous or people are good. Mm. And someone who would, would go with all um, Aristotle would say, no, you need to have a community and a state behind the community to enforce virtue. And someone who's more libertarian minded would say, no, 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 no. You need to be able to have freedom and liberty so that virtue will, will be able to um, come forth. This relates to critical race theory in one way. Critical race theory and a lot of its subgenres have actually taken hold and possessed the levers of institutional power in America, so much so that if you don't abide by them in many industries, whether it's sports, whether it's medicine, whether it's whatever, um, you can be, yes, you can be deemed um, a, a sort of pariah. And the force behind those accusations is what most people respond to. Mm -hmm. I don't think, this is just my opinion, that most folks deductively look at this and say, okay, I don't wanna be called a racist simply because I don't wanna be called a racist. Because if someone down the street who has no power, no institutional authority says you're a racist, that doesn't really affect you. But if your boss who just read Kimberly Crenshaw's new book about how to be less white or whatever, or Robin D'Angelo says it, okay, now you have an incentive. I think self-preservation is the main reason, not necessarily good nature, because you can preserve yourself without having any good intentions. And really, that's that actually is dangerous, because if we want to have a serious conversation about race in America, it cannot simply be about, I'm going to force you to do this, and if you don't listen to me, you're done, because people will become less interested about race and more interested about survival. Yeah, Christian, I think, I think you're putting here. your finger on, on part of what is in Adam's book. Uh, which is just the idea that for most Americans, 
this seems to be about status. Like this seems to be about a thing that they do in order to elevate themselves on right. social media, wherever. But I mean, I also think what Adam is saying is is true that like we are good. We want to be sensitive to one another. Like I don't want to use words that hurt people. I want to adjust the way in which I present myself so that people around me feel like they are respected. We want to be respectful in most cases. And I think that checks out in most of our daily interactions. People right. are trying to adjust. Um, and there seems to be this attitude that nobody is doing that. And I, I, it's not been my experience, at least. No, not for me either. Um, you know, I've lived in five states um, I, you know, throughout my life. Um, majority of the places I've lived at were not majority black. So I've been around white people most of my life. And I can't tell you the amount of times that someone actually treated me differently, specifically because I was black. Um, I remember the first time I was called the N-word. Um, but that particular moment was when I was a child and the kid was a child and that is learned behavior from their parent, not, not just because he was born with racism. Um, but even that moment was confusing for me as a child, but that never altered how I saw the world. I saw that kid acting like a jerk, but I moved upon, you know, moved throughout my life to see people for who they are. But that's just my, my personal outlook. Uh, having the opportunity in some ways to live in different places of the country had me see that people are people. Um, I think a lot of times, if you're black, you live around black people and you assume the other has something against you. It's like this uh, paranoia of the other. Uh, if you live in an only white neighborhood and you don't interact with black people, it might be possible that you don't interact with those other people and you only go based off of what you hear or read on the internet or whatever. So the exposure to other people really helps to expand uh, how you view people in the world. Um, so that's why my viewpoint, and maybe even Christian's viewpoint, I'm not sure of his background, but you know, interacting with different people of different backgrounds and, and different, uh, different places of America, and even for myself, I started traveling, uh, people from different countries, and you see how everybody wants just about the same thing. No one is specifically trying to hurt other people. We have our biases, that's normal, we're a bit tribalistic, but it's about are we willing to overlook our tribalism to accept other people? And the only way to really do that is to have some legitimate exposure. Um, I make the argument in my book that the vast majority of white people don't live around black people, but that's not of their particular doing, that is just what it turns into. We're extreme racial minority, despite what the media tries to show. Yeah. Every other commercial that features black people, you would think 50% of the population is black. <laughs> um, so it's, it's okay that people are not sure um, how to view someone, what is black culture, how do black people think, how do they operate. So messaging is really important to people who don't live around other people. And I want to I want to kind of go backwards just a little bit here to sort of like CRT and how it differs from yeah. maybe what we understand to be like, you know, we're, we're working at X company and they call us in to do like a, a corporate sensitivity training and sort of like a racial implicit bias thing. This was always, again, like we talked about sort of cast as benign. And corporations left and right are doing this. Mm -hmm. um, the American Medical Association, so a trade association, they have unveiled their new commitment to anti-racism as an association across all of medicine, right? Uh, so they have their five planks of what they are going to do to pursue anti-racist medicine. I'm going to read them for folks real quick so that we can discuss a little bit because this is one of the things where it feels like the ground has just moved underneath us. How can you object to any of this? The American Medical Association says, we will be embedding or we are committed to embedding equity and racial justice throughout the AMA by expanding capacity for understanding and implementing anti-racism equity strategies via practices, programming, policies, and culture to building allowances, alliances with marginalized physicians and other stakeholders through developing structures and coalitions to elevate the experiences and ideas of marginalized and minoritized health care leaders. Three, pushing upstream to address determinants of health and root causes of inequities by strengthening, empowering, and equipping physicians with the knowledge of and the tools for dismantling structural and social drivers of social and health inequities. Four, ensuring equitable structures and opportunities and innovation through embedding and advancing racial justice and health equity within existing AMA efforts to advance digital health. 
and another thing about truth, racial healing, reconciliation. How is this involved with medicine? <laughs> like, what, is, what does any of that mean? I read it, it's fluffy language, flowery. How can you object to it? Well, oh, well so uh, again, this is this sort of broad, um, pervasive, universal mentality of um, critical race theory. And let me just explain, let me do my due diligence and explain how anti-racism and everything relates to critical race theory. So anti-racism is a theory um, devised, the, the, the recent form of anti-racism. Traditional anti-racism is simply just not, you know, not being racist. But the most recent form by <laughs> even Max Kendi is a... a is it, no, it's not good enough. According to Kendi, it's not good enough to not be racist. You have to be, he says, actively anti-racist or racist. Um, and so for Kendi, being anti-racist is a political position, not a personal mental disposition. So for him, if you want to be against racism, you have to take up certain certain political causes. You have to fight for certain policies to be passed. And those policies tend to align with the uh, ideology of a certain sector of the political spectrum, which automatically um, uh, uh, basically gets rid of an entire sector of political life in America and marginalizes them and casts them all as racists by osmosis, not even by intention, by osmosis. And anti-racism and using this dichotomy is based upon the same structure of critical race theory, because both the anti-racist and the uh, and the critical race theorist both see society and institutions in society as irrevocably racist. Right, because um, Christian, upon like, the critical race theory has been around since the 70s. Like, this isn't necessarily 70s, yes. new. Anti-racism no. as no. its own operating ideology is new, and they've sort of yes. blended streams, right? <laughs> Well, Kendi basically just took the readings of Derrick Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and converted them into this new political ideology and, and cast it as being anti-racist to make it seem more universal and more acceptable. But in all reality, you look under the hood, there's some damages that have been done. So there is absolutely a direct connection uh, between anti-racism and critical race theory. You don't have anti-racism without critical, critical race theory. And so when these companies are pushing these anti-racist um, diversity trainings and sensitivity trainings, they're basically predicting predicating um, all of their um, all of the tenets of their trainings on a critical race theory understanding of the world rather than actually using other metrics to assess these things and they, so do, it's not they that don't want to be called racist that, like american airlines does right. not want to deal with anyone on twitter right. saying they are racist and then having to put out a press release about it and so all the companies just do it and then they pay exorbitant amounts of money to these like race consultants, right, to come in and talk about them and give them these different suite of ideas. And I, I just, I don't see a huge commitment to what they say so much as they feel like they have to engage in it. Yeah, um, whenever I see a private corporation actually implementing these particular things, like, you know, reading this through the, that you did with the AMA, uh, first I wanna say, I've never heard the word minoritized. Uh, that is, that's a foreign word to me. I don't even know exactly what that means. Um, but they're willing to implement these things that on its face don't really make any sense, all because of one word, liability. That's it. All, anytime you see these associations, these uh, large corporations, they just want to cover themselves. They don't want to have a situation where someone makes a claim that someone within the corporation treated them differently. They say, ah, we'll beat them to the punch. We've already implemented these policies. And so we're, we're covered here. It's not a company issue. This is an employee issue. So don't look at us. Look at that person. We'll fire them and we can move forward. Yeah. And I mean, Christian, you talked to, to James Lindsay the other day and y'all were talking about a, a hospital up in Boston. Um, I believe it is the Brigham Hospital of Boston, wherein, yeah, yeah, so it's the, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, wherein two of their practitioners wrote an op-ed for the Boston Review titled An Anti-Racist Agenda for Medicine, where they lay out sort of like their vision of how you would take sort of these AMA guideline ideas and anti-racism and put them into practice in hospitals. And it literally just involves wealth transfers, free service based on race, uh, and prioritization of services, uh, blood and transplants and all this stuff based on race and your, your ascribed status. Um, so it's just like, it's, you have all this flowery language, but like the crudest implementation possible, like the power to mm -hmm. decide life and death based on race and the, the, the service that you provide. Exactly, exactly. And what they're really doing here, again, 
So for critical race theory, I don't want to overstate this point, but for them, every aspect of society, every institution of society has some, if they're not racist, they have some uh, core of oppression. And really, the idea this comes from, I'm not going to get too in the weeds here, but the idea this sort of power over life and death comes from, it comes from a theorist, a French theorist called Michel Foucault, who wrote a theory called biopolitics, which basically argues that institutions and society have it, this irrevocable control over life and death in many different ways. And medical institutions play into that as well. So when you see the sort of intersection between Foucaultian ideas and critical race theory ideas, which are kind of based on the same exact thing, you get this kind of stuff. So when you have someone who is in a position of power over the health of people, or view themselves as in a position of power over the health of people, um, they're going to look at um, other people in their field and think, okay, how has my power, or how has the power of institutions historically impacted minorities in this field? And then what can I do to rectify those impacts? Because in all circumstances, given that critical race theory is a profoundly unscientific and profoundly unempirical um, uh, academic rhetorical device in all circumstances they come up with the same exact answer no matter what the circumstances are. So what you're seeing here is simply the culmination of ideology based off of ideas that reduce everything to a single quality and that is profoundly dangerous to interact in reality because reality is a multifaceted dynamic concept that cannot be easily understood by one single thing. CRT is about systems is kind of what I've learned here today because you know, we're not talking about sentiment, we're not talking about individualized attitudes, we're just talking about the entire system as it is constructed and then everything within it. Um, one thing that you said to me backstage, Adam, was just like the idea that this has been around for a while and we've already sort of accepted many of these ideas um, into our education system like decades ago. We're just sort of now seeing the fruits born now. And I, I think maybe one example uh, is where, you know, I, I, my background's in libertarian politics. We talk about systemic problems a mm -hmm. lot. Systemic racism in policing, uh, in criminal justice, who gets policed, who doesn't, uh, the street to prison pipeline, or even the school to prison pipeline, that there are systems that are in place that have like really bad racialized outcomes and therefore we kind of call them racist and like I've kind of accepted that as okay. Mm -hmm. This entire moment in our history has made me sort of like rethink that a little bit like if that, if seeding that rhetorical ground was actually a mistake. What do you make of that? Well, the, the big difference is that you're making these predictions or you're making these uh, conclusions, I should say, based off of facts. You know, you can look at a policy, you can look at the outcome, you can, you can uh, take all different types of things into account. You're looking at things that are real, that are happening. What they're doing is theorizing. That's something completely different. I can theorize about anything. I can theorize a ham sandwich, it doesn't matter. As long as I can make you uh, believe that that theory is true and it's happening, I don't really necessarily need to prove it. Uh, which is why when they try to use examples, it is pseudo examples, so that's why they'll, they're able to stretch, uh, you know, George Floyd being killed as a greater problem without wanting to even prove it. They just have an example, and then they use that as the antithesis of everything that they want to push forward. You're, what you're doing is actually basing it off of a series of things um, that even you, like you said, you may be incorrect. But at least you're basing it off of something that is true and that something that is real and something that you can counter, you know, something that you're trying to, to fight against. Yeah, you know, as a member of the libertarian tradition myself um, and the classical liberal tradition myself, um, I think there is a difference. When we talk about police brutality, we typically talk about it as a as an issue of officers who may be abusive in their personal lives or abuse, have abusive mentalities operating under the color of law to inflict their abuse upon other people. We see it. We, we see that, uh, that the system kind of aids it. But ultimately, there's individuals there, which is why libertarians are going to get rid of qualified immunity so that individual officers can be pursued. Mm -hmm. with the greatest heft and uh, in injustice. When a critical race theorist talks about systemic problems, they don't mean individuals. They actually intentionally exclude individuals because an individual can be good-hearted, kind-hearted, but if they are a part of an oppressive system, they will inevitably oppress people. So for a critical race theorist, a cop can be good-hearted, kind-hearted, use officer discretion to the highest bidder, but because that cop is a part of this policing system in America, they will do racist things. So 
So libertarians see it as an abuse issue that is not necessarily connected to race and has a lot of individual responsibility. Critical race theorists see it as a system issue. Individuals don't matter. And so how do you fix systems? With legislation, with laws. Libertarians want to use laws to prevent or reduce the possibility of abuse. So there's a very big difference in the libertarian account of what justice might be and the critical race theorist account of what justice might be because they're one is predicated upon individual responsibility, the other one ignores individuals at all. Yeah, and that makes sense because one of the things I started noticing, especially in the past year, the police officers that get the most heat are black police officers from black people and white people. Uh, that is the one time you're allowed to use all type of racial epithets towards black people if, if they're a black cop because they are part of a system that they're participating in. So they are selling out themselves, which is even worse, to be a part of this white racist system. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely referring to that part. It doesn't really matter so much that the cop is white. It really helps them that the cop is white to prove their point. But if a cop is black, then it goes back to the system that's in play. That's why they, I, I noticed that critical race theorists always move the goalpost. Um, you know, it, yeah. it goes from the cop being white. Yep. All right, no, it's not about race. It's the system that's in place. And then they, they, mm -hmm. just, they just keep moving until uh, you surrender the point. Uh, it's not about actually being correct. It's about um, instituting whatever they want to be instituted at that moment. Adam, your book is about victimhood and offers that this mentality is the reason we are at this moment and that victimhood runs beneath the surface <laughs> of a lot of our interactions and a lot of the way in which we think in this country. Yeah. Um, is that a correct premise of your book? Um, and how do we actually fix that and walk that back? So, um, you know, the book revolves around black victimhood, mm -hmm. but uh, it, the general theme is victimhood. Um, you know, the problem that's happening today is that there is a new type of uh, complex that's being invented called the savior complex. And there are people who are overtly trying to save people, not help them, help is different. Um, you know, if, if a white person wants to come into a black community to help, to lend a hand, that is different than uh, changing how they do everything and dictating what they do and then using the government to do, you know, this is a very savior type of way of thinking. Um, you know, so when we see these school boards implementing these policies, they're doing it from a savior standpoint. Uh, they're not doing it to help people because nobody was asking for this. It's empathy morphed to pity. Right, right. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a lowering of expectations of people. It's a pitying. But the problem is that um, the victims want this. You know, the victims want acceptance from the saviors. The saviors, it, it's like a, it's a sick mutual relationship. As a victim, I want someone to always help me. And when they're not there to help me, I'm bitter that they're not there to help me. It's the same way when, when uh, black Americans talk about reparations. We deserve reparations, yet the people who are alive were never slaves. They're generations down the line from being slaves. What is the point of giving you monetary funds that is essentially just gonna be printed by the government that, and, and we're just going to incur more debt and that money is coming from me as well, who's a black American. How would we even implement this? I'm, I'm half Trinidadian, so I only have half my bloodline from America. How would this even work? No one cares about that because all they care about is getting something that is unearned. And victims will always want something that's unearned. They want the sympathy. They want uh, the constant looking out for. They want changes put in place for them. All this removes your own responsibility you're no longer accountable for your actions. You're no longer accountable for how you move about in life. All your mistakes are someone else's problems. When we look at all these police shootings that happen across America, every single time uh, you can say that one, they have, they're either in a criminal act, longtime criminals, and we always put them as a victim of a particular situation. You know, um, George Floyd died by the hands of a cop, but we ignore that he was high. We ignore that he was a long-term criminal. Why does it matter if he was high or if he was a long-term criminal? I mean, it, that, that doesn't make any difference it on does. whether or not someone puts a knee on your neck. It doesn't in that aspect, but it does how you treat 
their uh, the situation afterwards. So it's an unfortunate. I'm not. No one. Will, no one will ever say that he deserved to die. You know, the state should be uh, should prosecute Chauvin, and they did. They found him guilty, and did. and that's and a lot of the complaints were that they didn't do it quick enough, as if like just having due process that took several weeks, well, months actually, right, for a trial to actually took place, that like that was the problem, right. <laughs> But the, there's there's two fundamental reasons why that his history matters. His history matters because one, we treat him like a martyr, and he's not. He's just a guy who died from an unfortunate situation. But if we treat him like a martyr, we absolve him from his part of why he even ended up on that ground. He was high. He he was committing allegedly committing a criminal act by giving counterfeit bills. He was resisting arrest. He was not willing to get into the back of the car. He wanted to be placed on that ground. All of these steps happen, and he is accountable for his particular actions. And I don't want to martyr someone who is responsible for their own death. You know, you, you, know, the, like the, you play you in You use the word martyr, like, and there's like this religious tinge to it, just yeah. like you're talking about the saviors. John McWhorter calls the people pushing CRT the elect, the people with the the knowledge to sort of lead and govern. And then you also have like the martyrs, the people who die at the hands of the oppressed or the oppressors, uh, and then are cre like murals created to them, right? Like entire murals and worship yeah. sites and all of this stuff. It is really impossible to separate it from religion and sort of this idea that this is all sort of like a spirituality of sorts. Well, even even Joe Biden said. His death is more uh, was a more impactful than Martin Luther King's assassination. So <laughs> <laughs> that's unbelievable. Yeah, he said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that tells you something. Um, you know, so the the martyring, uh, the martyrdom part really is concerning to me. And then there's the conflation of black criminal issues as being black issues. Those are the parts that that's why I talk about his history because. That is a black criminal issue, how he was handled as someone who's committing a criminal act. Christian, do you think that that's fair? Um, so, I, and I've seen a lot of people appeal to Mr. Floyd's vices as a sort of man, as a sort of way to um, reduce the um, halo of, 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 of martyrdom that has been imposed upon his head. And I, I think that's probably, that misses the point a little bit. Right. And, and and George Floyd, his individual responsibility and all that kind of stuff, that is fundamentally distinct from the individual actions of Officer Chauvin. Now, I say individual actions because a critical race theorist or someone in that same genre uh, would believe that Officer Chauvin's actions are simply the actions of a system that has been oppressing black people for however many years. But I believe that Chauvin and his contemporaries made a very grievous mistake by not necessarily um, entirely tending to Mr. Floyd's needs, by not taking a, a more less invasive action to restrain him. I mean, if you're an officer, as long as Chauvin's been an officer, and you are able, and you've been trained, you should be able to restrain people in many different ways. This is why choke holds have been banned in several states in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing. So we can not impose martyrdom upon someone's head, but we can still recognize that individually what happened to them was unacceptable without bringing up their uh, their personal vices. That's kind of a non sequitur, really. If George Floyd had been, um, the, 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 like, if he had been like Mother Teresa, would that make his death any more or less tragic? No, George Floyd was a human being and booed with natural value that comes from his ability to use rationality, use reason to walk and breathe and live on this earth intelligently as a human being can. And that alone is what makes his situation a situation that anyone should look at independent of his vices. Everyone has dirt. Everyone's made mistakes. Shulman actually had several abuse cases on his hands before the Floyd thing even happened. So even he had dirt. But we don't really hear that from a lot of people who are defending uh, Chauvin against George Floyd. So I just think that it's a mistake to bring up his vices. They have absolutely nothing to do with the grand significance of what happened in that particular moment. But I think his vices are important from how we view the entire, because all of this comes back to systems. They, they're trying to make the point that the system is overtly racist and that George Floyd is because his situation is because specifically that he is black. My argument is that his history matters because his situation happened because he's a criminal who happens to be black. Those are two separate things, and that's why his history matters in this particular situation. If George Floyd was on his way to church and he was killed in the same manner, then that 
is something else to, to kind of highlight, but that's not the situation. He's doing something specifically illegally that specifically brings in the state to act upon what is happening. Someone called the police on him. I'm sorry, go ahead, Christian. Oh, no. So, you know, illegality does not necessarily mean immorality. There are plenty of laws themselves that are actually fundamentally immoral. Now, in Mr. Floyd's case, Mr. Floyd was trying to counterfeit bills, and that's, uh, that's, that's obviously deceptive. That's wrong. But proportionality, the law of proportionality, which many uh, theorists like Cesar Beccaria, who, who basically provided the foundations for the American criminal justice system by and through the founders of the United States, would say that's an absolutely disproportionate act um, to what he did. Um, so, I mean, criminality, when you say criminal, it mm -hmm. kind of conjures this image of this sort of a grimy looking, you know, striped shirt bandit who is terrorizing the community and is living in immorality and scaring children. But in all reality, criminality can be as, as small as counterfeiting bills, uh, as, small, as big as robbing a bank, or as small as doing a jaywalk. I mean, we can't just use the term criminality to try to understand things, because that itself is kind of systemic as well. Adam, this, this, the idea I have a, of criminality just a quick is question for, for Adam here. Do you, do you place yourself anywhere on like the conservative to liberal spectrum? I am, um, I would say I'm more socially conservative. Mm -hmm. um, politically, I'm independent, but I tend to be more libertarian. Yeah, that's a good way to be. And I think this will, this will be a good starting point for this, this final leg of this discussion, which is like we've seen the consequences of critical race theory. We've seen the consequences of the things that critical race theory are trying to address uh, and I think making things worse. But the key question of this episode here today and this, this whole discussion is, what the heck do we do about it? Because there were efforts in the past year by former President Trump to ban critical race theory from being you know, pushed through the bureaucracy to being included in certain corporate trainings to push uh, the Department of Education to make sure that these things were never getting into public schools. Uh, he issued an executive order on September 22nd of last year to do just that. If you go to that executive order now, it comes up as an error 404 message. It has been taken down by the Biden administration. And in Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Oklahoma, Arkansas, North Carolina, state legislatures are pushing bans on critical race theory. Um, the, the one bill in North Carolina, Bill 324, it does a number of things that I kind of want to just put a finger on here real quick, which is that like, it, it tackles the ideas of critical race theory. It says that you cannot teach certain things in the schools, including like the belief that the US is a meritocracy and an inherently racist or sexist thing, or that the United States was created by members of a particular race or sex for the purpose of oppressing members of another race or sex. You are not allowed to teach under that bill an individual solely by virtue of his or her race is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. Um, you know, other things that just like put a, a, a limit on like what can be discussed by a certain teacher. And this raises the question like how, how do you actually react? Do you ban critical race theory? Because that seems like a, a really harsh measure to go with in terms of force of government. Well, as someone, again, who is a child of the libertarian tradition, uh, when people talk about banning things, especially banning ideas, yeah, I'm like immediately it. called back yeah, I'm, I'm immediately called back to John Stuart Mill's um, uh, what he said in uh, On Liberty, Chapter Three, I believe, and he talked about uh, how you know you need to merge experience with discourse to understand knowledge, and all that means is that I have to be able to experience knowledge or through a book or whatever, and I have to be able to talk about it. And banning kind of eliminates the ability to have discourse, or so you think. Um, but when you talk about banning, we're not actually banning the ideas from being necessarily discussed. Most these bills ban the ideas from being stated as unequivocal truth. There, in government schools, there is a very big distinction because the government already regulates education. And for a libertarian, that's a, right. a non-starter in the first place. But since the government already regulates education, it has the ability to set educational standards under the auspices of the First Amendment, so it is a government institution. So the government is already setting educational standards. Getting rid of teaching critical race theory as a fact is nothing more different than teaching teaching evolution as a fact, and that is the government setting standards about what it believes is valuable. If people really have an issue with critical race theory being banned in education, you know what you could do? You could push for the decentralization of education, push for the privatization of schools, and then you would be able to teach whatever you wanted to teach. But, but that is while a you huge problem to take on, the decentralization of education, whereas you just take sure. this fight 
straight to your state legislatures to ban certain kinds of curriculum. And like Democrats paint paint this this way. Like they say like in North Carolina that, you know, what they're doing is they're they're chilling free speech by teachers. They are putting a limit on what can be discussed and that like we should be able to have uncomfortable conversations in classrooms. Which just makes me flash back to being in school. I'm like, do you think we don't already have uncomfortable conversations in classrooms minus critical race theory and Ibram X. Kendi stuff being pushed onto teachers and classrooms and students? Like, we already have tough conversations about American history. So I just, it, it doesn't seem to me that, like, the hands-off approach for CRT is, is working. Like, if we do nothing, then they will steamroll the public education system entirely, and they will put this into curriculums if we don't stand up and use, I don't know, just like really strong means to say no, and that might be government force. I think, um, you know, the government is supposed to be by the will of the people. So if the people of a particular jurisdiction does not want something, that's our system. They can go up and try to lobby for that to not happen. So these different school districts where the parents are showing up, that is the number one step to try and push back against critical race theory. Whether it works or not, it's a different story, but at least that attempt needs to happen. I think in some of these places, the parents, they're doing their nine to five, they're unaware what is actually going on behind the scenes, so they're not doing anything about it. But I think more and more people are waking up, they're becoming more aware that it is happening. My thing is, I'm a realist. Um, will that actually stop the teaching of critical race theory? Yeah, Probably. You can't ban ideas. You, no. No. Yeah. And, and, and so, even though I'm saying go to your schools, make sure it's not necessarily part of the curriculum, teachers can teach in, in a variety of different ways. It's a matter of will they be disciplined, will they stop it, will the principal say, give them a wink and say, listen, I'm okay with it, just you know, don't be so obvious next time, or uh, maybe try this book instead. You know, it's going to happen, and it's been happening for years. We've all heard of the liberal teacher who likes to teach feminism. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's stuff like that where the teachers are going to teach in a particular way. Whether they stay neutral or not is a different story. I love the idea of like individualism in schools and classrooms. And I mean, I think by the nature of public schools, they can't have that. Like they want everything to be streamlined. They want all teachers to teach the same thing, to be the same way. But we've all experienced, we've been in public schools, right? Uh, luck of the draw. Sometimes you just get like that, that feminist teacher or you get that really macho coach uh, who is just like a total jerk. And there's nothing to be done about it because people are people and personalities right. differ um, and there's nobody to say that they have to act a certain way or believe a certain sort of things or, or tweet certain ways but like CRT and sort of like these curriculums these suggestions these webinars they do use force against people to submit to the ideas I'm fine honestly I'm really fine with a school having a discussion in the classrooms about how to be anti-racist as long as children can say that doesn't make sense I don't believe that right. <laughs> or say like this is this is wrong like if people can say wrong and object to it um, and not be punished then I think it's all within the bounds of open discourse and freedom but that's not what happens well so do I right and it's not what happens because critical race theory is not made for discourse Critical race theory is made for advocacy. It is basically, and if you read the tagline of some of these critical race theory papers, it, they basically say where academia meets advocacy, which suggests that academia is not meant for advocacy, but they're making it an, adv an advocating position anyway. And so the, so it's not necessarily an interested in, in having this free range of ideas. In fact, there was a paper written by a famous critical theorist who works with Kimberly Crenshaw, who founded critical race theory, called Mary Matsuda. And she basically used critical race theory to argue why by First Amendment absolutism or First Amendment, you know, being in defense of free speech is dangerous towards marginalized communities. There are critical race theorists who actually want to ban speech that can inflict psychic violence upon people. A critical race theory is absolutely not about, um, you know, having a free range discussion. Critical race theory is about implementing another a narrative upon someone else in the by the virtue or in the name of the virtue of protecting people who may not need protecting. And then if you don't do that, you're against those kind of people. So it's inherently a dangerous thing that does not warrant conversation. It warrants action, in my opinion. So I guess I want to wrap us up by just getting a, a solid vote from everybody on what needs to be done. Do you ban critical race theory in state legislatures 
or by the federal government. Adam? If the people want it banned and that's what they're advocating for, then that's what they want. Um, me personally, I think that it should be as local as possible. I'm not comfortable with any banning from, uh, you know, I'm more of a states rights person. Uh, I don't want the federal government to step in and decide how we do things uh, as far as how we teach and how we educate. That's part of the problem in the first place. If a local school district wants to not teach the kids in a certain way, you know, I've talked to educators. They say, if, if you as a parent don't like this, we're here to serve you. Yeah. And so if the parents don't want this, then the educators are not to teach this. We make it as local as possible. If there's a school district that wants to be anti-racist, well, now we know when we go into that school district what we're getting ourselves into. Yeah. Um, so I, I give the power to the people as local as possible. If this is what they want, this is what they advocate for. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go along with Adam on that one. Uh, local jurisdiction being able to go against federal bureaucracies and the federal government that might push these ideas, uh, and they can go right ahead and do it. Uh, no bans at the federal level, but state legislatures, I think they should go forward with what they're doing as long as they have a popular mandate. Same for school districts. Christian? Um, popular man yeah, popular mandate or not, state legislatures need to, need to ban this thing. And I don't mean ban it as in you cannot talk about it. I mean ban it as teaching it as fact. Because when you teach something in the curriculum, it's typically being teached as, as if it's an accepted thing, even if it's like a theory, right? Evolution's a theory, but it's taught as an accepted thing because, you know, it has a lot of backing behind it. And critical race theory has backing from all ma many legal organizations, civil rights organizations, many corporations. It has the same cultural force as a theory like evolution might have, or or at least it has the appearance of that. So, no, I say you 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 handle it at the state level, of course, not any federal bureaucracy, and you prevent it from being taught as fact. And um, you know, you uh, you know, it's it's not obviously, as Adam mentioned, it's not a surefire way to do that. But it is a statement. It's a statement that this theory cannot be used to enforce certain people to think a certain way about themselves, and that the value of American education is so much more than viewing the country as a a cadre of oppressive systems. So I say you handle it at the state legislature level and you go for it from that. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to have it with me. Thank you. We like to end every week on a positive note, particularly after really tough subjects. So let's wrap things up with positively a little bit of good news uh, going on in the world or in everybody's lives. Um, Adam, feel free to start us off. Um, I would say my positive uh, news is personal. Um, you know, I'm relatively unknown. Um, you know, I'm a new author. And when I first started writing this book, I didn't know if anybody would buy it. Um, but I put myself out there and I let God work through me. And he's blessed me with a ton of people who really care about the message because I'm displaying a positive message within the book. Um, you know, just even sitting here is a blessing to sit in front of you. Um, and it's something that I never thought would ever happen. And all I see are positive things coming in my direction. Um, and, and I'm meeting so many great people, uh, different ethnicities, uh, just people who want to be heard and discuss things. Um, and I, I feel that, you know, as much as we talk about critical race theory and all these different things, there are so many good people in this world, especially in this country, and they all want to contribute in some way, and they all care about very similar messages to what I write about. And so I'm more optimistic about the future than, say, before I wrote this book. So that's, that's my hey, positive. Hey, love to hear it. It's so nice to have you here, and the book is Black Victim to Black Victor. Uh, it's a really sharp book and uh, everyone should get it. We will put a link to it in the show notes for sure so you can check it out. Um, my good news, a little bit dorky and probably like the ultimate sign of my whiteness, uh, electric vehicles. <laughs> I am super excited about this just huge trend towards electric vehicles, not because I have any problem at all with gas powered cars, they're great. I want all of them, uh, but I just love new tech. And so the Ford F-150 Lightning is being debuted today as we are taping this. Uh, there's gonna be some big reveal event. This is like the most popular car in America, the Ford F-150 pickup truck. Most people in America drive this car. 
And it's just gonna be cool to have another option on the market. I don't know how much it's gonna cost. I'll probably never be able to afford one, uh, but it will be neat to see them out there and feel like we are just like inching just a little bit more into the future that we were always promised because <laughs> I will never, never forget being in fifth grade and hearing from a speaker who came to our school say that we were gonna have flying cars in 2030. <laughs> so it's like, I was lied to just like our parents' generation. It never happened. So I'll take the electric battery powered cars. <sighs> a little good news where you can get it. Christian, what's got you happy? Well, as we are taping this, um, it is my 21st birthday. So I'm always happy about that. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, and, and similar to, to Adam, you know, my journey, I, I'm still relatively unknown, but, you know, I look back at my 20th birthday and where I was in my journey. My podcast was just getting started. You know, I was just starting my YouTube channel. You fast forward to almost a year now, and, you know, we, the YouTube channel was growing steadily. I've got a stream of people who are interested in hearing the message of philosophy and liberty over some of the other nefarious cultural forces that are trying to take away the power of our institutions and their value. And there's nothing, there's not a better birthday gift than to look at my progress and simply smile and say, you've done well. So that's what's got me happy today. Stories of success and gratitude. Um, always love to hear it. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me today on Right Now with Stephen Kent. That is me, Stephen Kent. Uh, thank you for tuning in. If you have not subscribed already, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on YouTube or on your podcatchers. We have a new show every single Thursday, and we'll see you on the next one.